We had some plots in there that were the weediest looking corn plots in Maryland. We pur purposely planted plants that we knew were potential hosts, at least we could inoculate them in the greenhouse, next to colonized corn plants. And not only did we not find natural dispersal to those plants, but you could, you know, we hooked up a cultivator and just dragged it through the colonized corn right into the weeds and uh, didn't find anything. That The recombinant did not end up in these weeds at all, even though particularly like velvet leaf is a very good host for CXC, colonizes it very, very well. We did similar experiments where we dragged a cultivator through colonized corn into some other colonized, non-colonized corn farther down the row. And in these cases, at least with the wild type organism, we found a very, very low level of transmission. With the recombinant, we didn't find anything at all. Uh, whether that means the BT gene is is uh, holding it back or, or uh, slowing it down, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, about the only way we could really get trans transmission at a high frequency was to do ridiculous things like chop through with electric trimmers, colonize corn, keep the trimmer blades nice and wet so that they don't dry out, and then take that thing and chop through some weeds. And, and lo and behold, in a situation like this, you get a low level of colonization. Uh, last summer we found that probably the way CXC is transmitted in Bermuda grass most commonly is by lawnmowers. Uh, because it's a very good way to transmit it. You go mow your lawn with your colonized Bermuda grass lawn, and, and that seems to perpetuate it very well in that, that patch of Bermuda grass. So anyway, we don't, we don't see this dispersal uh, from, from inoculated hosts at a level that we're, we're worried about. The last characteristic here that I'm going to talk about is you, wouldn't, you don't want to see transmission of recombinant genes to other microorganisms. CXC, like I said, doesn't have any plasmids, doesn't have any detectable phage or any of these viral transduction mechanisms or anything that other bacteria use to exchange genes. This BT gene is inserted directly into the chromosome of CXC and it seems to be extremely stable there as far as the, the insertion itself. The gene just doesn't jump around. In fact, the CXC BT recombinants can't pass the gene back and forth between their conspecifics. Uh, they just don't seem to have any mechanism of doing that. And kind of our, our, our ace in the hole here, if anything like that was, was going to happen, is that the, the genes themselves, the CXC BT strains, have this load. Uh, we're getting results in now, and I don't have a a data slide for this because this is actually pretty new stuff that we've been working on. The, the gene, the, the recombinant itself reverts back to the wild type after a certain amount of time. Introduced genes seem to be a load and they don't confer any advantage to the organism itself. And the genes are lost at a low rate. That rate is uh, something like 0.6%, uh, 10, I think it's 10 to the minus fifth per cell per generation. So the the reversion rate itself is very low, but what happens is the revertants, once they kick out that BT gene, are more fit than the intact recombinants, and so they outcompete them. We've tested this by injecting mixtures of recombinant and wild type into plants and coming back and sampling at various times and finding that you get a rapid shift to uh, wild type. In other words, the recombinant is outcompeted. With pure cultures of recombinant injected into those plants, the uh, the shift is less rapid. The, the ramifications of this are that it's not rapid enough to affect product performance. Short-term efficacy doesn't change. After the, the season, at the end of the season in corn, we see about a 1 to 2 percent reversion rate. In other words, 1 percent of the colonies isolated from those corn plants are still are, are reverted to wild type. The rest are still uh, carrying the BT gene. But loss is an advantage from a, from a long-term environmental standpoint. If this thing, uh, one, one concern among the environmental groups is that this BT gene could get out and colonize weeds and either affect the food source of, a, of an endangered lepidopteran or uh, affect biological control of, of weeds by lepidoptera. I'm, I'm not going to get into an argument over that last one. Uh, I think there are a lot of arguable points there. But at any rate, the loss over the long term is an advantage because that, that gene, the BT gene, isn't going to persist indefinitely in the environment. So we think we've got kind of an environmental uh, suicide mechanism there, whereas this, this thing uh, will not hang around and, and 
and uh, be active. Well, at this stage, like I say, we don't have something ready to, to sell to a seed company or to a farmer. We're still in the, in the prototype phase. Uh, so our recombinant containing corn plants look just like a regular corn plant after it's been loaded up with, with uh, corn bores. <clears throat> this summer, we're working, like I said, with, with seed companies in, in the, the corn belt. DeKalb Pfizer Genetics is our cooperator at two sites in Hastings, Nebraska, and Iliopolis, Illinois. NC Plus Hybrids, that, that's the, the major company we're going with. We're also working with two regional companies, NC Plus Hybrids out of Hastings, Nebraska, Hogemeyer Hybrids, and Hooper. And then also a sweet corn company, Rogers Brothers, up in Stanton, Minnesota. Actually, the work is being done mostly in cooperation with Norfolk, Norfolk King. Uh, I guess both of those companies are owned by Sandoz, so... Uh, those are our, our cooperators. These, these tests will be planted next week, and uh, hopefully by the end of the summer we'll have a little more information on the, uh, the seed inoculation technology, the uh, environmental issues, and be ready to go next year with an efficacy trial. So I'll stop there. I think I've gone a little longer than I intended, but I'll take any questions that anybody has. Yes? Do you have any idea yet at all what the persistence of the endophyte will be in, in seed? It looked like you were inoculating a seed part of bag and bag seed could be carried over in the storage and right. sold on your way. That's, I'm, I'm not involved in the seed inoculation group, uh, so what I, all I can tell you is what I've got coming out of them, from what I've been told. And one thing they're looking at is, is shelf life. Uh, it doesn't seem to be, what happens is, let me put the screen up here. They've got studies now that have been going on for, I think, 13 months or so. Um, if you just look at time down here, and, and 13 months is the last, last I heard of this, they get colonization, if, if they inoculate the seed and then test the seedlings for colonization, they can get up to something like between 90 to 100% colonization, depending on variety. There's some varietal differences in, in success of colonization. Okay, this, this scale is frequency of colonization. In other words, inoculate 100 seeds, grow them up, how many of those 100 plants have detectable levels of endophyte in them? And another scale we can look at over here is the amount of inoculum, you know, CFUs per seed viable inoculum. And the CFUs per seed, you know, tends to, to drop down, and it drops down up here, they've got something like, well, they're getting in something like 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th or so. And after 13 months, it drops down to 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 7th. It's about a thousand-fold drop in recoverable CFUs per seed. But you only get maybe uh, down to 60% you know, or so, about a 40% drop in, in frequency of colonization. What's happening here is it doesn't, it doesn't require all those cells to inoculate that seed. You know, theoretically, it only takes one cell. So although the, the shelf life of the bacterium drops, uh, the viability, the number of viable cells drops by a factor of 100 or 1,000, that uh, doesn't really reflect the, the colonization efficiency of, of that inoculum. So, yeah, one of the things that they're ver very concerned about in our seed inoculation group is not having to have a system where the, that seed's got to be planted immediately. And they seem to be successful today. I didn't hear if you said or not, are you using, when you insert your BT gene, are you using the promoter from the BT then, or are you using the CXC promoter and, and RDS? We've been trying both. Uh, we've got several groups in our molecular genetics department that are kind of quasi in quasi competition. Uh, some are looking at BT promoters. Some are looking at CXC. You know, carving up the CXC genome and just looking for anything there. And they've you know we've got like phage libraries and uh, you know there's just buckets and buckets of these pot potential promoters and a lot of respects it's, it's kind of like a slot machine you know you're just looking for the right combination uh, 
again, I'm not a molecular geneticist, so I, I can't really uh, comment on a lot of the details involved in there, but uh, it, it's a matter of getting the volume, the flow through with volume up high enough that we can screen as many promoters as possible in a short amount of time. And, uh, you know, they've taken the approach of looking at CXC promoters, lo looking for proteins that are highly expressed in CXC and then trying to identify those promoters. Uh, they kind of call that the rifle approach. We've also been taking the shotgun approach, which is just basically sp cut up the genome into as many different pieces as you can and just see what happens. Just, you know, literally a, a uh, roulette wheel, I guess. John? The, um, when you get your uh, endophyte to colonize the corn plant, is that is that uniform or is it... It's know? not. Uh, at least all, all of the, da the data we have to date is on based on stem stabbing, you know, the, the stem inoculation. And what we see there is levels of, well, as high as 10 to the 10th CFUs per gram of tissue in some areas, like the basal stem. But a more reliable average would be about 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th. Uh, again, there's some varietal effect on that. Some varieties are more highly colonized than others. As you move up the stalk and uh, the, the xylem up near the tassels is, is colonized at uh, one or two logs lower than that. The leaves tend to be around 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th. The husks are chock full of it, uh, probably because it's just got a lot of xylem. Uh, and the seeds and the silks don't have anything. The roots are about slightly lower than the, the basal stem. But again, that is all based on, on inoculating it by stabbing it into the stem. We are right now just trying to find out how, how the seed inoculation affects that because right, right away what happens is you're giving the thing a head start. The plant is colonized as soon as it germinates. Uh, so we know that you get detectable levels in the plant. Right, right now if you, if you uh, stab it into the stem, it takes about three weeks before you get colonization of all the tissues that are going to be colonized and it reaches plateau populations. Uh, with seed inoculation, as soon as the thing germinates, uh, we usually you know, give it about two weeks to come up, and then you can ask that right away, and you've got high populations. So, yeah, when, when I started, I kind of naively went to the endophyte studies group in the, in the company and said, what I'd like to do is come up with a, uh, a nice little map of the corn plant that shows uh, you know, frequency of encounter. Uh, here's where corn borer is likely to be, and here's what the endophyte populations are in those plants. And they screamed at me because they were nowhere near that level of precision in identifying micro areas on the plant. Uh, you know, they can talk about leaves versus stem, basal stem versus uh, top of the stem, roots versus stem, things like that. Uh, part of the problem is it's just a such a tough organism to grow. It's kind of got a a narrow niche in the xylem of its host plant, and it's uh, you know it takes a while to grow it up on plates. We have contamination problems. We have to be careful because it's outcompeted by almost anything else that will get on that plate. So they haven't really been able to do the kind of tight, tightly uh, divided areas on the plant that I'd kind of hoped they had. Dr. Shalish. Uh, now let's let's assume you get it into the seed. And you're going to move this forward now to to germination. As I recall, you said that in a standing plant that it was effective or at least present seven weeks after harvest. Is that right? The way you're well, that now? what yeah, those were plants that were the stalks were just left in the field, standing stalks in the field. Okay, well let's move this forward to mm -hmm. germination. Now, at the time that the second generation ore is going to hit during silking and tasseling. Uh, is your persistence going to be great enough to affect that animal? Oh yeah, the, the, the population levels of the endophytes stay at peak levels, you know, with, with some fluctuation, I mean, as long as the plant's green. It doesn't really start declining until the plant itself dies. Uh, well, when the plant starts drying down is when it really, when it really starts to decline. But as long as you've got green plant material, you can recover viable populations of the endophyte. And then the, the point of those studies were that for 
seven weeks, up to seven weeks after that plant has dried down and you've just got the stalk standing in the field, that you can still recover detectable levels of the endophyte. Now the detection limits are such that uh, I think for that technique they're around 10 to the fourth or, or so CFUs per gram of tissue. So you know, we, we can't, after seven weeks we can't detect it, we can't say for sure that it absolutely isn't there. It's just below our detection limits. Uh, the, the detection limits vary depending on where you're isolating from. They're much lower from uh, greenhouse grown plant material than they would be from like soil samples in the field where you've got a lot of other competing organisms. Now the second question, uh, what level do you hope to attain as far as uh, uh, mortality of the, of the insect? So say well, coral stage feeding and uh, Right now, I'd just like to see something I can measure in a plant in a greenhouse. So, uh, I mean, that's that's something that is going to require uh, you know input from you know folks like yourself and uh, our own entomologists. It's going to you know it's it's really a something that our marketing people are going to have to be educated on. Uh, you know, at first be, before entomology existed as a science at CGI, uh, you know, we had people out there touting this is something that corn borers were going to take one bite and then drop dead, like we're injecting a pyrethroid or something into, into corn stalks. I think we've done a good job at educating our own marketing and, and executives uh, that what we're talking about here is probably going to be something on the order of a good resistant variety. Uh, just the nature of the toxin is not is such that it's not going to kill them outright real fast. Uh, you know, something we, we don't we don't really need high levels of mortality visible very quickly. Uh, you know, re reducing damage through growth reduction or cessation of feeding will, will give us a large part of what we're looking for. And, uh, you know, just coming down to educating these people on, on pest management concepts. You're going to be much safer also if you can leave a good part of that population out there. Sure. So they don't become resistant. Sure. I'll be talking a little bit tomorrow on, on potential for resistance development to this sort of thing. I didn't get into it tonight, but uh, there are some things about this system that make it fit very nicely into some potential resistance management strategies. Uh, a lot of ways for leaving you know, refugia for non-selected individuals out there uh, through things like uh, less than 100 percent colonization inoculation efficiency or uh, you know the fact that the colonization is tissue specific. Uh, so it's not, it's not really a constitutive sort of thing like, like some of these transgenic plants that are out there that every single cell is producing BT toxin. You should have been in Las Vegas last week. Well, there's a lot of uh, discussion on those lines that few yeah. people could address. Yeah, well, you won't get any argument from me there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You indicated that there were other individuals in the species that were pathogenic. This one did cause some stunting as DXC did, you know, but only under low light conditions or whatever, reduced light. And you thought that, that or concluded that was probably because it was too slow growing to be pathogenic under that, reasonably that's, good light conditions. Yeah, that's a, a non plant path, non plant pathology explanation of what's going on. But uh, uh, it seems to me that you also earlier you expressed that one of the shortcomings of this uh, CXC was that it had a uh, long doubling time. Mm -hmm. As a marketing or an optimization process in, the, in producing the CXC, uh, you would like to reduce the doubling time so that you can get faster or larger production rates and things like that. Is there a danger then of producing a strain that would be a pathogen? Well, I think so, and we're, we're definitely not taking the approach of fiddling around with CXC biology to increase its its uh, doubling time because the although it is slow growing, like I say, with a seed inoculated plant, we get the detectable l levels of, of uh, endophyte very quickly, and it's just a matter of will it attain high the plateau levels before, and, and you know, the, the root question is will it attain those levels before the plant's going to be susceptible to corn borer damage, and you know the answer seems to be yes. It's really those first those initial few weeks that it requires for colonization, uh, and. Uh, you know, we, we would just assume not mess around with, with the colonization levels. Uh, we're already talking, I mean, anything, the highest I've ever seen in, in, in a plant is about 
2 times 10 to the 10th CFUs per gram of tissue. And that you start getting up there and the plant pathologists start getting a little nervous. Anything higher than that, and it's going to start gumming up xylem elements and behaving like something like Stewart's Weld or Rattoon Stunt Sugarcane. Further questions? I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, there will be another more in-depth presentation tomorrow at uh, 9 o'clock in room 115, Science 2, and refreshments at 8.45 before the talk starts. So.